good day, people. Hope everyone is well. It's been a while, but I thought I'd do an installment, uh, again, promoting my most recent book called How Non-Being Haunts Being, and it's subtitled on Possibilities, Morality, and Death Acceptance. When we're doing this video is try to make three general claims about death. And the first claim is that we can see others who have died, but we will not see ourselves die. Second claim is that death for the human being is much more than biological cessation. And the third claim uh, is basically that by accepting death without any promise of an afterlife, we can bring like a profound kind of gratitude to the noble yet humble lot that humans are. And so let me see if I can go through each one of those and lay, lay a little bit more out on each one. Again, this first issue that we can see death all around us. We can recognize that others have passed. We can see, again, not only loved ones, but, you know, you see carcasses, you see dead animals on the road. And what you, what you witness there is life observing death, but death never observes life. It's not as if life and death are on par with one another. Death is part of life. Life's not part of death. Death is the, the ending of life. You don't get on the outside of life, looking in on life, in dying. I think another way to say this whole, this whole concept of this first, this first point is that life only knows itself from the inside. It can only experience itself from the inside. And that's this, this sort of miraculous, what Mobius strip-like nature of the universe. It's, it's very paradoxical, like life figured out a way to only open to itself from the inside. Like there's no way to stand outside of life to get a, a look into life, to experience life. The only people who have any access to life are those who are already alive. And even there, it's, there's a thrownness and a projection, right? to use Heidegger's terms, that when we talk about thrownness, that each one of us, by the time we came to self-awareness, we came to realize that we existed only after having already existed for some time. That is, none of us were in some state pre-conception, pre-existence, deliberating over whether or not to be born. And none of us chose to be born. And even after being born, we came to the realization of ourselves only after having been for some time. On the other side of that, as we're moving closer and closer toward our own death, it'll be something along the lines of, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. You don't ever get to, oh, now I'm dead. You know, if you get to, I'm dead, well, you're not yet. You're still talking to yourself about the fact that you think you're dead, but you're thinking about the fact that you're dead, but that's you alive thinking that. You know, I remember my grandma sort of saying, oh, I'm, you know, when, when I die and I go to heaven, I'm going to ask these questions to God and, you know, she's going to get her, her answers. And my own sense is that, you know, paradoxically, no one gets an answer about life other than the answers they come up with while they're alive. I mean, this is your one chance to grow in wisdom and to, to try to understand and appreciate the complexity that life is and how you're part of the mystery of, of life. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, we can see others who have died, but we will never see ourselves as dead. That's the first one. Second one is that death for the human being is so much more than biological cessation. And I, I need to get at this because I think this is such a, a such an important one that death, death isn't just the end of one's life for the human being. Now it is that, but it's more than that. It's we're aware of the fact that we're going to die. Like all all life that is born, right? Not just life that grows and divides, but you know, the, the, you know, eukaryotic cells. And when we start to talk about organisms that we can see with the eye that have a life cycle, you know, they, they all have a biological cessation and we will have a biological cessation, but humans with their sophisticated nervous systems, language, forms of communication technologies, we're able to know that we're going to die. We know that like as a fact that there was a death sentence that was issued upon our birth. And the awareness of that is the picture frame that makes human life the particularly meaningful endeavor that it is. That 
it's again, death is a kind of picture frame that makes life meaningful. It forces the hierarchical valuing of various life projects of goals that you realize that if you're going to die, you can't do everything and you're going to have to decide what exactly do you want to do with your life. You have to put your priorities in order. Like if, you, if you didn't know you were going to die, there would be a sense of no urgency in doing anything because you could just sort of imagine that you could always just do it later. Or, you know, certainly not initiative to do things that aren't sort of enforcing themselves as, you know, exigencies or, you know, impingements upon us. Like motives and, and goals, aspirations, they become more salient in, in recognizing that one can die. Now, I think... Unfortunately, there are so, there's so much religious dogma out there that seems to suggest that if when you die, you're dead, and there's no life after this, there isn't some sort of cosmic justice or some sort of recompense, then this life is meaningless. I, I've heard many people give the, the argument that if there's no life after death, then, then nihilism is the only possible response, and that that our lives are just, again, there, there's no ultimate value. There's no real value. It's all just transitory. And we're really no different than a squirrel or a chipmunk or any other forms of life. And I, I've tried to say, no, this is, is not true at all. And you know, the, the first move to do would do this kind of like Alan Watts move is suggest that life is a kind of a dance. And when you're dancing, you're trying to keep like a harmonious rhythm with the music as it's unfolding and it's meaningful in its unfolding. It's not as if you understand the meaning of dancing by getting to the end of the song. There isn't some meaning that's bestowed at the end that wasn't sort of, I guess, you know, it's, it's not an added to it. And if anything, it's, you know, it's the cessation of the keeping of the rhythm with the various kinds of music. Again, I, I think, even there, I've heard critics, you know, I've been in these discussions with people and they'll say something along the lines of, well, your dance argument is really weak because, again, it just, it stresses that we're really no different than other animals and we're just one more animal like other animals and we just die. And it, again, it seems like life for them is not worth the effort. There's, there's so much suffering and agony and hardship and pain and injustice. And then there's no true or ultimate meaning. And I think, no, again, this is wrong. I mean, humans are already different. We don't need an afterlife for a human soul, whatever that would mean. You don't need that in order to have life be meaningful. You've already had life be meaningful. Awareness of your death is that picture frame. And it has precipitated some of the amazing achievements of humanity, things like music, and things like science, and even for good or ill, you know, forms of religion, which have helped people transcend the here and now of their experience. And all of those are, I mean, music and art and science, technology, and, and forms of religion and cultural practice, all of these get the human organism out of the here and now of sensory experience and into this larger socio-historical cultural process. And they are forms of transcendence. Language, thought, communication technologies, they give the, the kind of robust claims of truth where we're not just, you know, roaring dinosaurs and or, you know, chattering chipmunks. We're actually able to make assertions that are true or false, but we're making claims that we're trying to adjudicate their truth, the truth how truthful they are or how false they are, right? Their veracity. And so it, it's not just like talking about a predator in the distance who potentially could, you know, take advantage of us or, or, or seeking out prey or looking for food. It's we can ask ultimate questions about things that aren't sensorily available. I can ask questions about my grandparents, about my grandparents' grandparents. I can ask about the origin of the cosmos. I can ask about, you know, what, what people are going to do come 2050. And we can even ask questions about what exactly is going to happen, you know, during the heat death at the end of the cosmos, something like this, right? So it's, it's because we know that we die that life bears meaning. It's not that life will have to have an afterlife in order to be meaningful. I mean, it's just, I think it's just basically, it's, it's a glitch that's come into people's thought because they've, they've taken the transcendence that language affords and then in a misplaced 
concreteness, imagine that that's also awaiting uh, those of us who are alive. And I think some of it just, it, it goes back to that first point that, you know, ancestor worship is a lot of the origin of death awareness, where people had to, you know, face the brutal fact that people who they cared about, loved with, who relied upon were no longer there. And they could commemorate that and recognize that and symbolically, you know, give a remembrance to those others who are absent. And I think what's interesting about this is that we can imagine an afterlife. And so maybe that needs to be talked about just for a second, that I think it is arguably one of the most amazing features of the human imagination is the capacity to imagine what the afterlife could be, what it might be, if there is one at all. And the ability to imagine the afterlife, you know, I, I wouldn't want to deny that to anyone. That's not to say that I believe that there is an afterlife. I think in some way, the belief in an afterlife, it, it partly absolves people from their responsibilities of taking care of one another, of realizing their transgenerational burdens, of how indebted they are to others and of their obligation to repay others. It's a symptom of a kind of over-individualization that happened, I think, in Western thought, largely due to literacy and other forms of communication technology. Uh, again, it's, it's not to say that people can't or shouldn't contemplate the afterlife, imagine the afterlife, but it's to ask about the consequences of that if it turns into neglect of their responsibilities of this world. And it's also not to confuse thought about the afterlife uh, among the living from some actual factual, you know, existence post-mortem. Okay. Now, I guess the last issue, this brings me to this last issue, and I'll see if I can wrap up here, that accepting death without the promise of an afterlife, fully accepting it, it brings, I think, a profound gratitude to one's life. And it's, it's a register of the very noble and yet very humble lot of the human. In one sense, it's very noble. We are aware of all <laughs> that is here. Now, again, there's, there's a lot that's beyond our awareness and we know that we don't know. There's stuff that we don't know. We don't know. We could give all that. But when you think about how much, you know, take a moment right now to think of all the things you know about. I mean, everything from all the different kinds of animals, elephants and giraffes and the tsetse fly and, you know, electric eels and, uh, just, you know, it's deep sea coral, all the different kinds of octopi and this kind of stuff. There's that then there's also the range of art and music and history. And there's all the things you know about science and about technology and about how things work. And just all of the things that we know that really is, it bestows a kind of nobility upon the human to, to bear the weight of, of understanding things. We're not just you know, covered over in the ignorance of biological process. You know, thought about the world, even though in some sense, it's similar to respiration and digestion and, and metabolism, just one more biological process. It's about the world and we can make claims about those and, and check the veracity. We can, we can assess the truthfulness of, of those statements. And and, and again, that's fascinating. And it, it really is remarkable that nature has opened up a part of itself that's self-reflexively open to deliberating in a self-conscious way about its own nature. That is also, though, you know, has to be coupled with the very humble fact that we are biological organisms who will die. And, and that's okay. I think so many people, it's like they imagine that if they don't, it, it, like if somehow they get convinced that there's no immortal soul, that that takes away from the majesty of the cosmos. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I'm not sure where people are giving, you know, where that argument comes from. You know, I, and I think I, I've heard many people, particularly people committed to a kind of dogma that they seem to believe that this life is only justified by something else that they can accept this life with gratitude only on the stipulation that there's something after, that there's, there's a promise of, of a better world than this. And I, I think that's really unfortunate. 
I, you know, I, I don't want to be seen as glib. I understand that this world is horrifying. It is absolutely horrifying. It is cruel and unjust and there's countless forms of luck of the draw and senseless stupidity and brutality and, and unnecessary hardship and suffering. And no one asks to be born and, my own sense is there's no life after death. And this is, this is, this is all you got. But to say, this is all you got, you got to go, okay, what did you get to, to have experienced all that you've experienced to know, to, to have known love, to have known laughter with friends, the, the, the real, the thrill of hearing music that, that brings tears to your eyes to, to experience just the majesty of the changing of the seasons Nature itself, in its immensity, in its the, the, the to, to try to comprehend the size of the cosmos. What what do people think they should be able to experience all that, know all that, and then not pay a price? I think it just seems reasonable to say death is the price, and death acceptance is gratuity on the way out. You've been invited to the banquet of all banquets. You know, what else is there to say? So with that said, please, what stocking is really stuffed without a copy of How Not Being Hot's Being? Please, people, check it out. Hope everyone is well. Take care. Bye-bye.